little bit closer to home because, as you've heard, my central theme tonight is promoting the simple question, is Australia today the Australia we want it to be? I've always regarded, and so do my viewers, Senator Matt Canavan, the Queensland Senator, as one of the most formidable intellects in the Federal Parliament. Needless to say, in speaking truth and offering a different viewpoint, the rare politician makes enemies and indeed may well jeopardise his future in the short term. My optimistic view is that the canavans of this world will in the end prevail. It was only last week Matt Canavan issued a statement which said in part, quote, I don't come to Canberra to make friends. I come here to fight for our jobs and our livelihoods. He said there are lots of Canberra people who want to shut down our cattle, coal, cotton and other industries. Thousands of jobs will be lost if they get their way. He said others want to take away our cars and guns. Said Matt Canavan, earlier this year a coal-fired power station in central Queensland exploded. It was a freak accident and fortunately there was no loss of life or injuries. But he said thousands of people lost power immediately. Over the coming months, he said, while the power station was taken offline as a precaution, Queensland recorded its highest ever electricity prices. But then this critical point, the explosion in Queensland was unplanned but within a year, we will start the planned closure of coal-fired power stations right across Australia. The aftermath, he said, of this year's explosion shows that we are not ready. Well, this program will unapologetically promote and foster common sense. Matt Canavan is simply too smart for some of the dunderheads occupying political benches. He said, and I quote, building coal-fired power stations is not inconsistent with a net zero emissions goal. Four countries that have signed up to net zero emissions are building 129 coal-fired power stations right now. China's building 95 of them, despite saying they'll meet net zero emissions." Unquote. And as Senator Canavan rightly says, over time we should look to build reliable power stations that have lower emissions. We should research hydrogen, battery and other technologies, but none of these technologies can work at scale today. He went on, one low emissions technology that does work is nuclear. Of the top 20 nations in the world, only Australia doesn't have a nuclear power station or doesn't use nuclear power imported from another country. Our status, he says, as a nuclear outcast is the more remarkable, given that Australia has the largest uranium reserves in the world. Unquote. Well, thankfully, this program will take people like Matt Canavan to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of viewers here and internationally. He joins us from Queensland. Matt Canavan, thanks for your time. Look, just simply, what kind of energy madness is seeking to overtake us? Well, you can simply put this madness, uh, Alan, into the example where we send our energy resources to the world but refuse to use them ourselves. We send... Uh, the world's best coal, uh, the world's, world's best gas, we're the biggest gas exporter now, the world's best uranium uh, to other countries for them to make stuff. And then we buy back uh, the more expensive goods uh, because they're processed, they're manufactured. We have to buy them back on our credit card, our nation's credit card, to just make do in, in the way you need to in modern life, to, to have cars, to, uh, to, to have oil, uh, all these types of things, when we could actually make more of this stuff here. Uh, and... Uh, I think we should be making stuff here again in Australia from our own natural resources that God has blessed us with, uh, rather than simply let other countries do all that. I'm all for exports and we've got so much stuff. We can share it with the world too, but there is so much more we could do here, so much more manufacturing we could do if we just kept more of it here for our own use. But see, Matt, the public who are listening to you now say, well, what choice do we have? Because both major parties seem to be singing off the same sheet of music. Net zero emissions, no approval for new coal-fired power stations. But as you said, wind energy takes up to 250 times more land than nuclear power. Solar takes up 150 times more land. So are the green activists who'll give their preferences to Labor not about changing the climate but changing the politics? Well, you still do have a choice, Alan, and ultimately you've got a choice between uh, a Labor Party is beholden to the Greens and they last week have announced a new carbon tax. They've hidden it in their policy. It's going to be a tax on 215 businesses around the country, mainly our mining and manufacturing, what's left of our manufacturing industry, uh, and, and run that into the ground if you vote the Labor Party. And yes, there are lots of other parties on the right, on the right side of politics, but uh, ultimately, I'd argue, you've got to put those Labor and Greens guys last and also get behind and support those people within the Liberal and National parties, uh, like myself, who are unashamedly pro-Australian, who unashamedly want to see 
uh, more little yellow kangaroos hanging off goods in our local stores. Uh, that's, that's an agenda we can get behind. And the more support those people give uh, to, to members and candidates uh, within the Liberal National Party, the stronger it'll be. I'm not alone there in Canberra, Alan. I, 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 yes, I don't go to Canberra to make, to make friends. Um, I'm back home now. I was allowed back to Queensland. And all I care about is my family and, and yes. friends here. That's who I care about. But I do have some friends in Canberra who are joining me especially in the Nationalist Party, where the Nationalist Party in the Senate, we are moving. Mm. Uh, we are moving amendments to remove the prohibition on nuclear energy uh, because that's what we believe in. And I know many um, Liberal and even Labor members support us on that move. So we've just got to have the public support on that. And where the public goes, eventually the politicians will go too because they well will stay in their jobs. Well, look, you made a very valid point. You said there was a reason President Xi of China didn't attend the Glasgow summit. Your words, he wouldn't be able to keep a straight face while the woke West commits collective economic suicide. And you said this is the wrong time to be handing the Chinese Communist Party an industrial advantage. But that's precisely what we're doing. Absolutely, Alan. I mean, Glasgow was a complete flop and fast. We all saw that. It was the best comedy on TV for some time. <laughs> I, I do actually kind of miss it. But, but uh, in terms of where it's put the Western world, the woke Western world, it's been an absolute disaster because as soon as Glasgow was over, uh, senior Chinese government officials were there saying and announcing that they're building more coal-fired power stations. It was revealed that China's building over 100 nuclear power stations that they'd kept secret and hidden from the rest of the world. Uh, and so we can all see in front of us this challenge that, that China presents. And it's not me scaremongering about this. Our no. defence officials yeah. are saying that we could end up in a conflict even possibly Quite. sometime well, soon. And if that's the case... Why aren't we bringing more manufacturing jobs back to Australia? Correct. Why are we continuing to sell out our future to other countries and not protect ourselves first? Now, look, just on this issue of Glasgow and climate change, what has passed with no debate or comment anywhere were the comments of the British Chancellor's Rishi Sunak. Now, he's a 41-year-old, born in Southampton, Punjabi Hindu parents. They immigrated from East Africa. He's got degrees from Oxford University and from Stanford. He's a Fulbright Scholar, so not stupid. Now, that Glasgow conference, he pledged, he didn't urge, pledged that the gathered politicians, quote, rewire the entire financial system for net zero. So if all else fails, make the financial world achieve what Glasgow couldn't. Matt Canavan, why aren't the public told that financial institutions have now signed up to a Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero and they hold assets worth over $130 trillion and yet you've got this academically smart young man describing an historic wall of capital for the net zero transition around the world. I mean, what do you, what do you make of that? Well, I think for, for, for Rishi, uh, he has to seek to distract and hide the inadequacies of uh, his own departments. He's the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the UK Treasury that he's in charge of released some modelling during Glasgow, which was woefully inadequate. It didn't actually... Uh, uh, it wasn't allowed to, apparently, if you read wasn't allowed to put down the t total cost of reaching net zero. What it did reveal is that a carbon tax would need to be imposed of over 200 Australian dollars uh, to reach net zero. And that's what these financial markets are, are licking their lips at. Uh, our banks and our but, financial markets are licking their lips yes, at but, the prospect of a massive new carbon trading scheme but, but they've gone uh, for, that will but, mean more bonuses and profits for them. But, Matt, they've gone further than that. I mean, that Mark Carney, the former governor of the Reserve Bank in England, said in October 2019, firms that align their business models to the transition to a net zero world will be rewarded handsomely. Those who fail to adapt will cease to exist. So does this mean that the farmer wanting to buy a new harvester for $750,000 will have to prove his commitment to net zero emissions? That's the road we're heading down, Alan. I mean, I see it already in my part of the world in central Queensland where many businesses, small family businesses, are being told they have to, they will not get finance if they have a certain exposure to the coal industry. So that's happening primarily at the moment in mining services businesses. Now, the banks, when you question them, deny that it will ever extend to farmers. But we, we've seen this before, Alan, that that's where it will go. Uh, the next step, once they knock off the mining industry and the small businesses that rely on that, they'll go for the farmers and other people as well because they don't like the methane emissions that cattle, uh, cattle produce. Uh, and if we want to deny uh, uh, these uh, our new overlords that are based in the city in London or Wall Street, if we want to deny them to, uh, their ability to rule ourselves, we need to stand up now. Definitely. And that's Definitely. why we need to look at things like the fair banking rule in the United States, where if an activity is legal 
uh, it should be a requirement of having a banking license in this yes. country that you you provide services to. Yeah, it because... doesn't mean you have to lend to everybody. You've, no. of course, got to make a risk-based no. decision on a particular business, but you shouldn't be able to redline, if you like, yes. entire in legal industries just because you have Absolutely. a certain level of moral But that's what they're aiming to, to do. I mean, laws of this country. I mean, these so-called financial institutions are playing this ideological game with our deposits, our superannuation funds. Well, it's, it's worse than that, too. They're, they're taking over our democracy. Yes. They're putting themselves in effectively a legislative position here, saying, well, we get to decide what's effectively kosher and not... Uh, in society. They're unelected, Some, and most of them are, don't even live in Australia, and it goes to this broader agenda of how we need to get our sovereignty back. We need to get our sovereignty back by bringing back manufacturing, being, being self-sufficient. But we also need to get our sovereignty back by making sure we reinvest in the democratic institutions that are the right ones for this nation. And that means that people who live overseas, you don't get a say in what we do. The people who get a say in what Australia does should be Australians. Uh, and they express that at the ballot box every year. Yes, I, I know, but I mean, none of this is discussed in the National Parliament. None of this is raised with the public. This is happening behind the scenes. And these ideological zealots are talking about all this stuff with money that comes from taxpayers and consumers. Now, surely if bank lending is predicated on meeting social and environmental goals, then we really have the makings of a financial crisis. We do, Alan. I, I think there's one extra component of that, though, you're right to say a lot of this is taxpayer funded, but it's further than that. It's also um, it's also financed through the printing press. Uh, that lots of this extra capital that we're seeing invest in the world in green energy is being financed, and the taxpayer deficit that go with it is being financed with uh, the the, um, the the churn of the printing presses uh, around the world churning out more money. Yes. We've had 15% growth in our money supply since the coronavirus here in Australia. In the US, it's even been higher at 15% a year. And uh, I do think the wisdom of, uh, of the famous econom economist Milton Friedman holds that inflation is everywhere and anywhere a monetary phenomenon. If you print more money, Quite. you're going to lose the Quite. value of that currency. Yes. And that's what we're seeing on mass here as inflation hits record levels mm. in the United States. That's it. And the people that get the most by inflation are poor families yes. who can't afford the rising costs of food Absolutely. and energy that will come in an inflationary crisis. Undeniable. The inflation I mean, is, just another, is just a tax by but, another name but, but, but you're for those saying, families, and you're, that's what's coming down our road. But you're saying that and no-one else is saying it. I mean, you've got the ANZ Bank, who refused, who refused earlier to keep funding the port of Newcastle, which is the world's largest coal export port, under its climate change policy. I mean, banning loans to the coal sector, an ANZ Bank, and the... the well, I think it's, uh, hey? It's, our one of, it's, our, it's, our, it's one of our biggest ports in the country, not just yes. in the world. It's, uh, I mean, it's a bit smaller than some of the iron ore ports over there in the West, but it's a massive tonnage, a huge strategic asset. One, we sh I should say that h half of the port is owned by firms connected to the Chinese government now, which is a whole other story. Uh, and then you've got our own banks finishing the job, saying that they won't, uh, they won't uh, lend to it. Uh, and it goes back here to the problem yep. we've got in corporate Australia, Alan, where if you go into yes. most yes. Uh, large corporate businesses in this country, you will find more rainbow flags flying yes. than Australian yes. flags. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is a great sadness to me, given the history of corporate Australia has played in building our nation. Giants of the past, like yes. Essington Lewis, the head of BHP, yes. uh, people who helped build this country uh, were patriotic about it. Yes, they were businessmen. Yes, they were profit-seeking. They had to do the best interest of their shareholders, but they were also proud Australians and proud Australians first, and they, they knew through war and depression the importance of putting your own country first. Absolutely. I think that's something we've lost in this, yep. in this period of decadence yep. almost, if you like, where in the last few decades in my generation we haven't experienced large recessions. We had a large one last year, but the government came along and actually made everybody gave everybody more money. Mm. Uh, so we really haven't felt the mm. deprivations that previous genera no. generations have and, and, and if the felt, and if, therefore are forgetting the importance of our nation. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, if the financial system is going to be doing the heavy lifting for net zero, we've got a formula for financial ruin. Just before you go, Urea. Now, everything that grows the economy on any given day relies on trucking. The 16 diesel trucks are described as the lifeblood of Australia. 17, almost yep. everything we buy, spends some time on the road. We're told the trucking networks could grind to a halt. I noticed the government couldn't give an answer only three days ago, four days ago, as to whether the supply is adequate. There's a looming shortage. What can you do to update us? Where are we? Well, we have been distracted, Alan. I raised this issue of urea while Glasgow was on a month ago. And uh, the last urea manufacturing plant in, in Australia, in Brisbane, announced that it was closing next year. 
and I raised the alarm bell then that this is a major issue, as you say, for our transport sector. It's also the most commonly used fertiliser for food production in Australia, and we wouldn't be able to feed ourselves on this dry continent if not for fertilisers like urea. It's a major national security issue. And look, this week the government has announced a task force to uh, look into the shortages. We apparently may run out of urea as early as next February. That's uh, very scary. But you have to ask the question here, why have we been so focused on 2050 when apparently we couldn't even guarantee energy security in 2022? Uh, that surely should be the highest priority. High priority should be, highest priority should be tomorrow. I want to make sure my family is fed next week. Um, yes, it's important to also put away for your superannuation, your retirement, but there's not much point putting away for your retirement if you're not even going to get there. Uh, so we need to make sure we get back to the here and now in this country, protect ourselves. Um, we probably will be able to get urea from some other sources like Japan, the Middle East, but we're going to be much, much less secure now because we're shutting down our last urea plant. And I should end it, Alan, here. Urea, it's very important for people to understand, urea is made from gas. So we can go talking around hydrogen and batteries and all this other stuff, you can't make the most important fertiliser in this country without fossil fuels, without gas. And so if we turn our back on traditional forms of energy like coal and gas and oil, uh, we really are risking our own ability to feed ourselves. Amazing. It's wonderful to talk to you. Close your ears while I talk to our viewers. How good a Prime Minister would this bloke make? On top of the issues, listening and talking to people. Matt, always good to talk and we'll talk again. Keep delivering the big doses of common sense. Lovely to talk to you. And Matt Canavan, we'll talk to him often.